Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite up back to the stage, Mr. Julian Thomas, Master of Wellington College, UK. Thank you, Julian. Good, good, good to see you. Hello, everyone. All right. No teleprompter required this time, <laughs> so we're okay. All right, well, apologies for a few of those little um, technical difficulties. No problem. All right, first off, uh, want to ask you, uh, have you had an opportunity to come to Thailand before? Uh, so this is my second trip to Thailand, and both occasions have been on business, so it's been a case of rushing between meetings and hotel rooms and so on. So what I haven't had the opportunity to do yet is see the incredible sights. But I've got my eye on uh, a few things that I'd really like to do. Right, what, what, uh, what do you have in mind that you'd like to see here? Well, I, I've heard so much about the temples. The Grand Palace, of course, is something I would absolutely uh, love to see. Uh, I've heard great things from people who've been here about the floating market. Um, and, uh, and of course, at some stage, I would like to, uh, while I'm in Thailand, go to one of your incredible beaches, which are very, very different to the British beaches, I have to tell you. Um, and uh, I think even the James Bond Island is here somewhere, isn't it? The, uh, yes, that's the man right. with the golden gun somewhere, so I'd love to see that. Yeah, Scott Tallu, is that what yes, it's yeah. called? All right. Um, well. Uh, we hope that we'll be able to facilitate your journeys here in Thailand in the near future. Oh, uh, but we'd like to ask you a little bit about uh, the journeys that you've taken in the past. I, I know one in particular you took in 2014. Yep. Is, uh, a, you actually went to Antarctica, to, the, right. to yeah. the, uh, the continent of Antarctica, and you, you made the trek to the South Pole, um, un, an unassisted trek. So you, weren't, you, you didn't have a a snowmobile, you didn't, have a, you didn't have a sail pushing you along. Um, you basically walked the whole way, is that right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's a, an amazing experience for me. Like, this photo always makes me smile. Uh, I'm on the right-hand side, by the way, that's, that's me. And, and, and this is uh, not staged. This was uh, a photo of us arriving at the South Pole. And that, that red and white object there, that is the bottom of the Earth. That's the South Pole. So this, this is a journey that is uh, the, one of the coldest, highest, windiest, and in, in some ways driest places on Earth. So it's very, very uh, harsh conditions. Um, the, the first exhibition, uh, sorry, ex um, the first expedition to the South Pole uh, was uh, by uh, Edmondson. And there was a concurrent um, exit, uh, expedition to the South Pole at the same time uh, a British team that went and actually on the return trip uh, they perished on the way back and yeah. I know that the the trip to the South Pole itself was quite difficult but what about that return journey when you when you've already reached the, the your goal and then you're on your way back what did you yeah. was there a learning experience with that yeah no I think um, for, for me it was always about reaching the pole that was that was the thing that I I was desperate to do, but it's, it's interesting you mentioned Captain Scott because he was the reason why I, I did it. Uh, I, when I was a very young uh, child, I used to have, I wonder if anybody uh, ever has ever heard of the Lady Bird adventure books, and, uh, and I had one as a nine-year-old, which was Captain Scott's adventures in, in Antarctica. And, uh, and from that moment on, I wanted to, to go there. And so uh, very, very much of me while I was out in Antarctica, I was thinking about Scott and about that team and, and, uh, and, and the other great Edwardian explorers like Shackleton. And so just being in Antarctica, arriving at the South Pole, there was a real sense of connection with those incredible people. But I would never even remotely put myself up against those people. Those, those guys did it with the equipment was terrible. Uh, they didn't know where they were going. They were, it was uncharted territory. And, uh, and if they got into trouble, there was no way of getting them out. So um, you know, they're true heroes. And what was the most difficult part of the journey for you uh, along yeah. the way? So um, I, I'd spent my entire uh, preparation, two years of preparation, just thinking about the physical side of things. Could you, could, was I capable of, uh, of take going a thousand miles with, uh, with, a, with a, a sledge that we were pulling, 90 kilograms? And, uh, and I'd really focused only on that physical aspect. Um, but what I've discovered really was far more uh, difficult, the real tough thing. Uh, when you're over in on an expedition like this, but really with anything, is uh, is the mental aspect. So you know, really coping with the highs and lows, 
you, you, it's very up and down your emotions uh, while you're out there and, uh, and just keeping going, that sense of hopelessness as your uh, sat-nav, the yellow dot on your sat-nav, and you look at it each night, you've been dragging a sledge for 11 hours and you look at the yellow dot and it hasn't moved from off the yellow dot from the previous day and, and all you can see is white in front of you, so it feels quite hopeless. Um, uh, but you've got to keep going, and so, so dealing with that mental challenge to me was the, the biggest thing. How long did the journey take in total? Uh, two months. So yeah. one month there and then one month back? Oh, uh, yeah, 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 that's right. right. And um, do you ever have, uh, when, you, when you were out there, um, did you ever have that feeling of, uh, I think we need to turn back? It's, it's just... It, it's getting too arduous. At this yeah, um, and I know for me because uh, for, for me I was I was uh, uh, desperate to the point of obsession to to reach the South Pole. One of the team mates we started off as a as a team of five and we ended as a team of four. Um, we didn't eat him, don't worry. But um, uh, what, but 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 there was an evacuation. So you know there was a moment in time when a. Uh, a sort of evacuation plane uh, came in and, and they, they, they looked at us and they said, does anybody else want to come? And, you know, that was just an easy answer. You know, it just, it, as hard as it was, as, as, as mentally exhausting, um, you know, I just wanted to get there. I was desperate. Since the, the first explorers went to the South Pole, only about 300 people in total yeah. have made that journey. And along the way, many of them have perished so it, isn't, uh, it, is, it is a very serious undertaking indeed. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, now going from uh, one pole to another in a way, physically, uh, literally, uh, going from extreme cold, you actually also experienced uh, extreme heat as well in uh, the Marathon de Sables. Yeah. And this was in the Sahara Desert. Uh, yeah. the, this was a equivalent of running six marathons back to back in the desert and you had to carry all of your supplies with yeah. you during that. Um, can you tell us about what, what, what were you thinking? Why, why <laughs> run across the desert? Yeah, lots of people say, what were you thinking? And uh, I suppose a little bit is just you know, being a bit crazy, but uh, uh, I, would, I was just really keen. I, I, I love pushing myself. I like, I like um, yeah, to, to set myself a challenge, whether it's professionally or, or in something like this. But, um, for me, I, having tested myself in the cold, I, I wanted to see what happened in the heat. Um, and there was, yeah, I know, it's sort of strange, isn't it? But uh, there, was, there was something else that someone once told me, and, and, it, uh, and once I had it in my head, I, I couldn't shake it. And that was, there's this thing called the 100 Club, and that if you do an expedition uh, where there is a, a difference of 100 degrees between the, the, the two extremes, so minus 50 in Antarctica and plus 50 in the Sahara Desert, then you get to join something called the 100 Club. So, um, so going off to the Sahara just seemed like the natural thing to do. And, uh, and this was, um, okay, just to give you some perspective, I, I can't even think of a running one marathon. I'm, I'm thinking climbing the, the, the stairs up to the SkyTrain station here in <laughs> Bangkok when it's 50 degrees out, yeah. I'm already like, oh, jeez. But you, you were doing... How many, how many kilometers was it in total? Here? Yeah, so it was about uh, 250, uh, two, 270 kilometers, I think, over, over the, the five and a half days. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. But it was for a good cause. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, we, we, for, for this one, um, my friend and I who, who did it, we raised money for a, a building a school in Africa. And uh, the Antarctic expedition was to raise money for a premature baby unit. Any more mountains to climb, literally or figuratively? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, goodness, Everest is still there, so, uh, so, so that would be wonderful uh, one day, and that was, that's always been an ambition of mine. But on, uh, in about three weeks' time, I begin my skydiving training, so, uh, so the next challenge is to become a, a licensed skydiver, so uh, we'll see how that goes. And do you have any... Uh any fear of heights to overcome, or is it just yeah, I mean, something... Yeah, the whole thing absolutely terrifies me, and I think that's what makes it so much fun. Um, I, it's uh, incredibly... I, I know that uh, doing something like that will take me to the limits of, of, of what I feel I can ever really do. Um, and standing on the side of a plane, getting ready to jump out, I know will absolutely terrify me to, to the core. So I think that's part of this whole idea of, of trying to find challenges and, and goals to do. Either that or it's just a midlife crisis. I don't know. But what. 
So instead of two months or, or six days, you, you're, you're getting it down to your challenges. This one's going to be about, what, five minutes? Yeah, yeah. well, hopefully not five minutes. Otherwise, it, it, that might be a bit too long before you open the parachute. But uh, yeah, something like uh, 90 seconds or two minutes. Uh, but, it, but then you have to do lots of jumps. And uh, uh, it'd be great. I mean, wonderful to, uh, to get a license and, and then be able to do it anywhere in the world. So that'll be fun. Right. But yeah. And at Wellington College, do you have any uh, ambitions for for the school to do anything along these lines, any kind of uh, big challenges? Yeah, well, I look, I'm really into um, adventure uh, side of things. I think you learn a lot. I think you, you get incredibly inspired by those sorts of things. But what I, what I really want to do with Wellington is, is, is for every child to find the thing that makes them tick. Uh, for me, it happens to, to be this sort of thing. But uh, uh, I think every, every child is, uh, has, is capable of being inspired by the thing that they most enjoy doing, the thing that really uh, gets under their skin. Um, I, I get really angry I, I, and upset when I hear people talking about children who are uh, disengaged or, or, or they're trouble causers or, or, or they're restless. Uh, and I hear occasionally, not at Wellington, but I've heard in the past people say, well, I don't want those children in my class. But I've, I've really been, uh, I'm absolutely convinced that those children are just disengaged because they haven't found the things that, that, that really make them tick, the things that inspire them. And I remember a child at a, at a school previously who uh, I, I, I actually caught him coming in to school really late once, and, and I asked him what he was doing, and he looked at me and he said, sir, I know I'm always late, but I make up for it by leaving early. And, uh, and he, he, had, he had disappeared down the corridor before I realized what he had said, but that child was really disengaged. He didn't want to be there. He wanted to be anywhere else but, but being in school. And the reason I remember him so well is because about 18 months later, I saw him again. And he was a completely different child. He was the first into school. He was the last to leave. Uh, and, uh, and he had a permanent smile on his face. And the reason was uh, we'd started a, a kit car club. It was like for, for mechanics. And they wanted to build an engine and then race the car that they'd built. Uh, and so from being un completely uninterested in every aspect of school life, this boy couldn't wait to get into school in the morning, and that's because we'd found the thing that inspired him. And, and I believe that you can find that in every single child. I think for you, particularly, your journey, you, you weren't someone who decided early on, oh, I'm going to be a teacher or an educator. Uh, you actually started out in, um, in IT, yep. in, the, in the finance world. Um, can you tell us, you know, it was, it was a situation where you found your calling a little bit later than other people. Was there a moment you just woke up and said, I need to be in education? Yeah, nearly. Um, yeah, that nearly happened. I, uh, I was working in the city in, in IT. I thought I'd pretty much convinced that was going to be my career uh, from then on. And uh, I, there, there's, a, there's a station in, uh, in London called Liverpool Street Station. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of that, but it's a very you know, large, famous station. And I was working uh, for BP at the time. and. Uh, and I was about five years into my career in the city. And I was on the escalator at Liverpool Street Station. And I was going up the escalator. And I was thinking to myself about the day ahead. Uh, and to be honest, I was dreading it. And I knew that I'd spend most of the day looking at the clock uh, to see what time uh, it was going to be time to go. And I remember being on that escalator and I had this sudden moment of realization that there was just, I couldn't do this for the rest of my life because I needed to do something that, that had meaning to me, that mattered, that, that got me out of bed every day, that inspired me uh, because I wasn't inspired by what I was doing. And, and at that moment, uh, which is now for me the seminal, mo the single most important moment in my life, uh, was on the escalator there and I said, well, I'm going to become a teacher and, and uh, I don't care what I have to do to get there. That's what I'm going to do. And, and by the end of that day, I had uh, contacted uh, universities, and I had signed up for a, for a PGCE, which is the teacher training qualification. Uh, and I look back on that, and I think, oh, thank goodness that happened. Because now I still watch the clock, uh, but I, I watch the clock hoping for it to slow down, because there's so much I want to do. Uh, and every day I get up, and this, is, this may, might sound sugary, but it's true. I look forward to every day. I know that every day is going to be different. I never know what the day is going to hold. And I'm really excited about every single one. And you take today. You know, that, that moment on Liverpool Street Station has led me to Bangkok on a stage talking to you all. And, and what an amazing journey that's been for me.
I know that Chris, our headmaster, said that when the opportunity came for him uh, to apply to be the headmaster of a new school, Wellington College, Bangkok, that he said it was his dream job, yeah. that it was the, the number one opening in the world at the time. And, uh, and he was obviously thrilled to, uh, to get selected, and, and we're, we're very happy to have him. You're a great boss. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, Chris is wrong, actually. It's, it, it's the number two opening in the world. The number one opening but it's is not my job. <laughs> <laughs> but can you just tell us a little bit about uh, what it felt like, you know, from that escalator journey yeah. until, uh, until you were selected as the, the new headmaster, the 14th headmaster, uh, to follow in the footsteps of the great Sir Anthony Selden at uh, Wellington College. What was that moment like for you? Well, it was, yeah, I mean, I'm j joking apart, I agree with Chris. To, to me, this was, this was getting the, the, the best job in education worldwide. And, um, you know, what I do, I, I, people never believe me when I say this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. I, I, I'm, I'd never set out uh, to be uh, a, a head teacher. I, I, I didn't, I wasn't an ambitious teacher. I just wanted to do the best that I could for those um, that I was responsible for. Um, and again, this is something that's really informed the, the way I am as a head, because uh, it, it's quite clear that what happens is if you enjoy it, uh, if you, you work harder at something, if you work harder, you're better at it. If you're better at it, you're more likely to be successful. So all I ever wanted to do was do as good a job as I could do in the role that I was in, uh, and that led me steadily along this path uh, until that day when Sir Mike Rake, who was the, the president of the CBI, probably the, the top businessman in, in the country, in the UK at the time, uh, phoned me up and, and told me I got the job at Wellington. It was, uh, professionally speaking, the, the best moment of my life. All right. Well, we're glad that that journey has led you here, and uh, we're very fortunate, we feel very fortunate that we're going to have you for a few more days here in Bangkok. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Julian Thomas. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much.